Welcome everyone to this RMI webinar. My name is EJ Clockman-Cook and I'll be your moderator today. We're going to have a conversation about the experimentation at the interface of urban design and new mobility. The work we're presenting was conducted over the past 18 months and made possible with the generous support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. There's a lot to go through, so we've kept this webinar high level. There are two reports and a blog that go into much greater depth, and those links have been provided with the email that you received earlier today. Please ask any questions through chat, and we'll have an extended Q&A at the end of the presentation. So, your presenters today are Greg Rux, Heather House, Ben Holland, and we will also hear from the CEO and co-founder of Public City, Meredith Powell. But first, I'd like to turn it over to RMI's CEO, Jules Kortenhorst, to kick things off. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to have you on this webinar and very excited to share with you the results of 18 months of work in the intersection of urban design and mobility. Rocky Mountain Institute has its origins more than 37 years ago in understanding the uh, uh, human's impact on the planet and the transition to a sustainable energy future. Increasingly, we recognize that the transition to a low carbon, sustainable mobility future is a crucial part of that sustainable future. And it has therefore been very exciting for us to see our program in mobility grow over the last couple of years, both here in the United States and internationally. One of the big realizations in that journey has been how important urban design is for the way we move about in cities, both here in the United States and elsewhere around the world. You've all seen the impact of polluting cars on the streets in Delhi, in Beijing, and elsewhere in the world. And thinking about new mobility paradigms and new urban design is a critical ingredient to cleaning up our planet. So we are very grateful for the help we got over the last two years from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and specifically Mike Painter to do the work that we are presenting to you this morning. And for the details on that, I'll turn it over to the principal in our mobility practice, Greg Works. Thank you so much, Jules. So going into a little bit more detail on our transportation work, as Jules already referenced, um, there are kind of three elements of system change that we think about uh, that also represent the elements of a future mobility system. The first is mobility as a service, which involves a shift from personal vehicles, which of course dominate today's system in the US, to a variety of modes that are available on demand. And on the next slide, you see that because the vehicles providing mobility as a service are shared, their cost is spread across several users and they accumulate miles more quickly than they would if they were personally owned, and what that does is enhances the economics of electrification, and that applies both to standard EVs and more recently to electric bikes and scooters. Um, of course, autonomous vehicle technology as well, which of course is already taking root in many cities across the world, is not applicable everywhere, but where it is, that further reduces the cost of operation and therefore traveler cost. As Jules mentioned at the beginning, we're doing a lot of thinking about how urban design influences the mobility system. So we actually include this as a third element in uh, the mobility system of the future. Um, and it refers to the influence of urban design on mobility. And we've actually concluded based on our conversations with people in urban design and mobility uh, over the course of this grant over the last 18 months or so, uh, that it's among the strongest determinants of the speed of adoption of this new paradigm. And urban design also is a strong determinant of who benefits from the shift and how. So to give you a little bit more detail about what we've done with that, uh, for the last few years, we've had a presence in Austin, Texas, and through a partnership with the community there, uh, including the city itself, the city government, local organizations, and the private sector, we focused on implementing aspects of this new system. Um, so to give you a quick example of some of our work, we worked with employers to make new commuting options available in Austin, uh, encouraged and in some cases facilitated new mobility providers coming into the city, uh, including those focused on mobility electrification and also those focused on ultimately implementing autonomous vehicle technology 
And finally, through this project, of course, we experimented with changes to the urban form to reduce mobility-related emissions, improve health, and enhance equity. So I wanted to go into a little bit more detail around the link between urban design and mobility and how that does, in fact, impact environment, health, and equity. So first of all, uh, urban design links to our goal of reducing mobility-related emissions in two ways. First, you can reduce passenger miles traveled and auto dependence by improving walkable access to food, local services, and social gathering space. And secondly, urban design plays a role enhancing access to the actual mobility services that can replace cars, uh, such as shared electric scooters and bikes. Uh, on the health front, urban design features that encourage more walking, of course, also improve cardiovascular health. Um, social gathering space increases social interaction, which is linked to mental health. And at the system level, reducing passenger miles or increasing use of electric mobility reduces pollution of all kinds, leading to improved respiratory health. And finally, on the equity front, low and middle income communities often have an urban form that isn't supportive of affordable and accessible mobility options. So concentrating those new services including dockless or free-floating bikes and scooters and car share, for example, in underutilized parking lots, for example, uh, can begin to address that inequity and give those communities who are currently underserved by those types of services better access to jobs, healthy food, and health services. Um, so to give just a framework of the way that our project that was supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation over the last 18 months was structured, um, we began our work in Austin with a focus on policy and particularly land use code in recognition of the influence the code has on what land uses are permissible and therefore what types of mobility services can work. Um, but we recognized that we needed to complement that focus on policy with a more demonstration oriented approach. And that's really how our RWJF uh, project came together. So the first phase of that was research and global benchmarking which was understanding the landscape of best practices in terms of what cities have done worldwide to enable mobility through urban design. And then we had a pilot phase, which is in many ways kind of the meat of our project. So we were on the ground in Austin conducting several pilots that were geared toward further understanding uh, the relationship between urban design and mobility uh, with a focus on those health equity and emissions impacts. And then we have a final phase that we're calling Mod City, which is a concept for a site or series of sites that would basically enable large scale and sustained experimentation at the interface of urban design and mobility. And that'll kind of frame what we go through in the remainder of the webinar. So I'll hand it off to Ben to cover some of the highlights from that first phase, our research and global benchmarking work. Thanks, Greg. Um, as Greg mentioned, we uh, had the opportunity to uh, capture some best practices on a global scale. So um, thanks in part, or thanks in, uh, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we were able to visit a number of cities internationally and really uh, capture some best practices related to urban design and how design can affect mobility in a positive way and reduce uh, the use of personal vehicles. So in November and December of last year, we visited Copenhagen, Barcelona, Prague and Mexico City. And during that time, we met with a number of great organizations and individuals and really came away with a lot of insights that informed our work for the, the uh, following year and this past year. Um, and I'll just run through some quick highlights, starting with Copenhagen. So we were excited to go to Copenhagen. It's arguably one of the epicenters of urban design and uh, human scale development in the world. Um, what you see here is an image of the Stroll, which is a street um, that prior to the 70s was uh, largely dominated by automobiles, a highly congested thoroughfare through the city. Copenhagen then made the decision to turn it into a pedestrian space. And um, what was initially kind of met with opposition uh, from the citizens of Copenhagen is now one of the most critical sort of popular tourist destinations in the city and highly influential in other similar efforts around the world. And then going to Barcelona, Barcelona was really interesting to us because uh, we had read about and really were, were excited to learn more about the Superblock program there. Um, you can see here an area of Barcelona in the Poblo No neighborhood, nine square blocks were converted into pedestrian space. 90% of the intersections there were turned into uh, 
sort of congregation space, playgrounds, as you can see here, um, trees were brought in and a number of other kind of uh, urban design improvements. And um, like Copenhagen before, this was met with some opposition from the residents. However, today it's quite popular and it's being expanded throughout the city. Um, the next city that we visited was Prague. And what was really interesting to us there was that um, the city of Prague's done a tremendous job in uh, bringing together kind of a collaborative discussion around uh, urban design in the future of the city. We had the pleasure of meeting with Martin Berry from Resite, who's really taken a leadership role in uh, creating this open forum uh, to discuss the future of the city. Um, and the city itself has uh, set up a number of other forums, including a Center for Architecture and Metropolitan Planning. So that, um, it, that was really inspiring to us as far as um, really engaging the community in, in the future. Of the city. Um, finally, we went to Mexico City. Like a lot of the cities we visited, Mexico City has a very strong bicycle infrastructure that they've been putting in place for the past few years. Um, what you see here is a uh, is an image of the Ciclovia initiative. So every Sunday in Mexico City, um, a number of streets will shut down to uh, make way for bicycles and pedestrians. And uh, what we saw here was just an extreme amount of enthusiasm around the use of that space. And it's uh, had a tremendous amount of influence and in other similar initiatives around Central and South America, as well as the globe at large. So moving on to our pilots, many of the, many of the lessons we learned from, uh, from those site visits and the stakeholders we talked to, we, we, we wanted to take those and really deploy those in, uh, in the city of Austin. So we conducted a series of pilots in Austin that were aimed at really exploring the relationship between urban design and mobility, and most importantly, understanding and enhancing the way that they affect uh, health, equity, and the environment. So in the interest of scalability, we also wanted to create an adoptable toolkit that cities and other organizations could take um, and deploy where they live and work. Uh, so with all of our pilots, we surveyed people on the ground before and during the pilots, and we also deployed um, cameras to conduct some observational analyses. So moving into our first pilot, the curb access pilot, this was, uh, this was really aimed at understanding whether a loading zone, uh, replacing park and curbside parking with a loading zone could enhance the mobility, the user experience of using ride hailing, um, accessing alternative mobility services, but also really improving safety. So um, you can't really see it from this image, but this is a, a snapshot taken from our camera. At night, uh, we observed uh, on a number of occasions a significant amount of loadings taking place in the middle of the street, very kind of dangerous atmosphere on the weekends at night. Um, our loading zone demonstrated a very clear improvement in safety in, uh, in loading those passengers. And the next slide is uh, really just an image of one of our partners, Municipal Parking Service who worked with the city of Austin to deploy some sensors that gave us some data on the usage of that space. <clears throat> our next pilot, the Community Mobility Hub, is really the most critical piece of our work over the last year. We spent the better part of the year searching for a location, designing, and ultimately implementing the pilot here um, at 12th and Chacon in East Austin. Now, we, we we selected this site for a variety of reasons, which was initially most interesting to us was that this is this was a highly auto-centric environment. Uh, most of the space in and around 12th Street dedicated to vehicle storage and parking, um, but the neighborhood surrounding it is very walkable, highly bike bikeable, um, has a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, for an alternative approach that's based on uh, not single occupancy vehicle or personal vehicle ownership, but uh, the use of alternative mobility services. And those alternative mobility services were largely absent before coming into this area. So we uh, saw a great opportunity to do both um, work in bringing those complementary mobility services into the 12th and Chacon area, as well as improving, enhancing the, uh, the urban environment there. So moving into the, the um, mobility aspect of this project, we really had the pleasure of working with a number of mobility service providers to to incorporate their services in and around the site at 12th and Chacon. You can see here um, some examples of those services. We worked with Bird, Jump, Cardigo, Lyft, and Lime. Um, 
Bird, Lime, and Jump deployed their services at the site um, every day of our pilot and uh, continued to do so. And Cardigo established, established two parking spaces at the mo Mobility Hub. We also work with Lyft to uh, institute a discount, discount code for users of the space. And, um, and through these partnerships, we, we were able to capture, uh, we were able to demonstrate really um, a strong value proposition in, in providing these services for people in the 12th and Chicone area. And moving on to placemaking, on the placemaking front, we really wanted to transform the space with some improvements that would create a strong sense of place, as the term implies. Um, we, we observed that the, criti the most critical change that we could put into place would be uh, shading at that site. Um, you can see here an image of uh, the shading structure we added. Uh, prior to doing so, this is, it, this is very much kind of an urban heat island um, at 12th and Chacon. Um, the placemaking improvements we made also included uh, some trees and plants that we brought at the site. Um, this greatly enhanced the environment there and the user experience of uh, accessing mobility as well as uh, the other amenities at the site. You see a food truck there. Um, since the inclusion of these improvements, we've also seen two additional food trucks come to the site. Um, I should also mention that much of this work was influenced by Meredith Powell, who, uh, who helped really drive our placemaking and community engagement strategy. So I'm gonna pass it off to her to talk about that in more detail. Thanks, Ben. Um, we were absolutely thrilled to be able to play a role in such a critical pilot that RMI led in Austin. Um, talk a little bit about our experience in the urban environment and mobility as it relates to engagement. And then we'll also talk about some lessons learned that we um, discovered in our, in our placemaking work and our engagement work that we really learned from spending time on the ground with the community and hearing from them about what their needs would be uh, to make a mobility hub in their neighborhood valuable to them as well. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about what frames our perspective. Um, about 15 years ago, before starting Public City, I ran an arts organization. And the important thing about that is that annually we closed down anywhere from nine to 12 city blocks for the annual art festival. And what this did was really frame our idea of how to, number one, take over a place and make it interesting and, and, and have it community driven in terms of its offerings, but also because it was such a, an important location in Austin, Texas, where we're based, which was at the intersection of two major thoroughfares, we had to also figure out how to get people around the city that weren't attending the festival and also get people to the festival that uh, would hopefully incentivize them to leave their cars at home. So this really framed our reference in terms of how we dealt with the urban environment and how community and mobility play a role and how urban design can really shift um, to meet a community's needs. So since then, um, we have obviously are learning lessons every year from how we can better uh, arrange a site, uh, provide more mobility options. And at that point, it was really public transit and, and bicycle and, and walking. And now there's such a variety of services that it's, uh, it's exciting to take what we learned then and implement it now. We've also worked with transit authorities to incentivize folks to get out of their cars. Uh, we've, we've looked at um, how can we reclaim alleyways for not only uh, mobility purposes and alternative routes for biking, but also for community spaces. Austin was at a real risk of losing its um, alley infrastructure to super block development. And so we've brought the community to the table in that instance, um, we've worked in Dallas looking at the safety of its streets and rapidly urbanizing environments. There had been uh, some car pedestrian deaths, and so how could we uh, work with the community to slow traffic down, uh, things like that. We've, we've also worked at a larger scale in terms of looking at downtown Austin and how do we bring the community together to help shape mobility services, mobility offerings, um, and ways people actually get around the city so that downtown Austin continues to develop in a way that uh, the community is involved in its development, but also mobility is at the forefront of how people get around. Uh, so the, the next we're gonna talk about what we really learned on the ground uh, with East 12th Street. We had fortunately spent about a year working on a different project with East 12th Street Merchants Association, who was one of our major stakeholders. So we were fairly familiar with the dynamics of this area um, and, you know, when you start to evaluate a site, community context really matters. And in this instance, we wanted to be really straightforward uh, with the team at Rocky Mountain about the complexities in which they were stepping into and looking at 12th and Chacon. Um, 
So one of the lessons and kind of top lessons that we talked about with the team um, and that we learned a lot from in, in terms of our engagement was really to appreciate the community context and adjust accordingly, adjust expectations accordingly, um, and think through how important a, a community's perspective is on, on shaping something like mobility. Before I go on to the next one, I, you know, a lot of our engagement work had really been about bringing a community together to experience the potential changes uh, and, and get that kind of insight. In this instance, um, in this instance, the work was really important and critical to uh, have one-on-one -on -one relationships and really ensure that we were building trust with the community. And so instead of doing a lot of active engagement on the front end, uh, we really just spent time with the stakeholders one-on-one, -on -one, better understanding what their needs are so that we could, again, build that trust that was going to be critical for the community mobility hub and for Rocky Mountains uh, part in Austin to really um, feel like it was sincere and that it wasn't going to be uh, an instance where, you know, we are might gotten what they net needed and, and left. So that was really important. Community context really matters. Um, one of the other things that really was helpful to us about midway through the project we were able to uh, commit to a placemaking budget. And this was really important because as we were talking to community members and really trying to set the expectations of what a community mobility hub would mean, it was very helpful to be able to say, we're looking to invest you know, this amount of money into this area of town and we're looking to invest it in ways that will benefit you um, and, and, and would be you know, something that would help serve a need for your community. So it's really important to walk in understanding or at least halfway through our project in this instance, know that we are working with a budget and we were ready to invest that budget to benefit the community long term, not just short term. Another one of the lessons learned through the community engagement process was really to, because um, in our initial conversations with the community, mobility was really not top of mind. While it was critical to move around this location, mobility in this community, uh, it, it just wasn't necessarily top of mind, at least for the organizations that we were working with and the stakeholders. I think you'll, you'll hear later um, with some of the survey results and things that Heather will talk about, that the on the ground conversation is different and mobility is important, um, but, but top of mind for the stakeholders, it was not. And so, um, you know, one of our recommendations would be to intertwine those conversations. How can we bring kind of these mobility services, which are, which are just now coming into the market, a little bit unfamiliar to people um, in this particular neighborhood? they really were on the fence on do we want this type of mobility service or not. And so if we, uh, getting to a point where you can in, intersect the mobility as a service as well as the placemaking engagement, I think would be helpful. This looks a little bit more like some of our previous work where it's a really active engagement where you can test some of these mobility services, bring some of the mobility services a little bit deeper into the neighborhood so that People can learn how to ride, say, a scooter or uh, an electric bike, things like that. If we, could, if we could have intersected those two, I think that that would have been helpful for the long-term success of, of the hub, as well as getting people to the table um, once, our, once our engagement work was done. Another component of what we learned and what uh, came out through our placemaking plan is not only to invest in the infrastructure, so not only invest in the shade structure and things like that that made it a more comfortable environment, but to also invest in the ongoing programming of the place. Um, really looking at is, you know, how can, when we talk about community engagement, when we take, talk about placemaking, it goes much, much beyond urban design. Um, and improvements in urban design. And so how can we really ensure that we're bringing the people component into this conversation um, so that we've got some buy-in and that the space can continue to evolve over time in a relevant way for the community that it's meant to serve. And along those lines, um, really thinking about serving the community's needs beyond mobility. Um, because if, 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 if this location or the hub becomes valuable for multiple reasons, um, whether it be in this instance, there were more food offerings. It was a more comfortable environment. If we can bring um, more assets to the table in, in terms of program, that way people will find uh, more of a reason to come back and come more often to the mobility hub itself. And another thing that we felt was really important and critical that we made in our recommendations for the placemaking hub was to use some of the dollars that were going to be invested in the hub to support and sustain local organizations and their participation in the hub. 
uh, this is, uh, you know, from our perspective, can, the, the pilot work is done and the, and the physical improvements are complete in terms of the 12th and Chacon area. However, could we have invested money uh, in local organizations who are on the ground with ongoing programming and help them, you know, incentivize their part participation in the hub so that it stays an active, interesting place and evolves over time as the neighborhood evolves over, over time with trusted partners um, and things like that. So this, we learned a lot on the ground. We had, um, in terms of our time working on the project, it was about a three month time frame. So did so, you know, really short, compact time frame, um, and really though such an incredible opportunity to learn. Uh, and knowing the work that RMI did uh, in terms of permanent infrastructure investment, um, being from Austin, I, I'm really thrilled to have been part of the team. Thank you, Meredith. And we really enjoyed having you work with us. Um, this was such a valuable component to our work. Um, in addition to the community engagement that Meredith just outlined, data can collection was another really important component of the Mobility Hub um, and was another tactic for community engagement that we were able, because we were able to have informal conversations with the interviewees. And I kind of wanted to refer back to what Meredith said um, about some of the high level stakeholders not being interested in mobility. Um, one thing that we found really interesting is that we had a different perspective when we were on the ground working, um, doing, this, doing the interviews with your average resident and transportation was a topic that was brought up as an issue quite frequently in our, in our baseline survey. So that was kind of one lesson learned um, that some of the perspectives might have been very different from your average citizen to kind of your community leader as well. Um, and so anyway, we, um, we designed our surveys to engage the people around the hub with the goal of measuring health, emissions, and equity. So all of those surveys asked a variety of questions around arrival mode, satisfaction traveling to and from the space, social interaction, access to essentials like your grocery goods and health services, also satisfaction of um, the, the space and also self-assessed self -assessed health. Um, and all those questions were asked in three different time periods. We asked them originally in our baseline data collection before any changes had been made to the space. And then we asked them again in our second phase, which was after the mobility providers brought in all of their services. And the last phase was after we made improvements to the physical space. The separation of the data collection was intentional because we really wanted to understand how health emissions and equity are impacted by mobility alone. And then also comparing that to how those three are also um, impacted by the combination of placemaking and mobility. So after analyzing all the data across the three phases, we noticed an interesting and major shift in arrival mode. After placemaking, there was a big shift of pedestrians who were no longer driving by car and arriving by foot. We also saw across the board that people had a very strong sense of value to the space. Though it was extremely minimal, the satisfaction traveling to the space and of the space decreased, and we hypothesized this may have been due to very strong rains during the placemaking phase. When we did these surveys, we ended them with an open-ended question asking, what would improve the area or what do you think of this space? Um, and that was kind of what I was discussing earlier about our form of engagement on the ground as well. Um, and one thing we found really interesting is that in the post-mobility phase, the topic of better transportation, which was raised frequently in the baseline um, surveys, was not predominantly discussed. Um, and so we think that this may have been due to mobility being added to the space um, from the, our mobility partners on a reliable daily basis because in addition to that, walkability was not discussed at all as it was in the previous phases. Um, and then we also saw that after placemaking, there was an overall positive response to the improvements of the space, specifically around the shading, which made it bearable to sit. Um, as you know, in Texas, it gets very hot in the summer. Um, and then also due to the greenery that broke up, the sea of concrete, we also had um, a positive response to the mobility, which, um, we saw early on that we had some people asking, I, when I was on the ground, I actually had a couple come and ask me why they don't have scooters on the east side where they have them on the west side of town. Um, and so, you know, hoping that they were happy to see them arrive after our mobility phase. Um, 
And then I also encountered another young gentleman who was running eastbound on 12th Street trying to get to his work site. And he saw me standing next to Scooter and he stopped to ask, you know, what is this? How does it work? And I was able to tell him how easy it is. Um, and he he told me that this was something that was going to help him get to and from work um, more quickly. So since the Doxus Mobility is so new, we were encouraged to, and very excited to see that it can truly improve equity through mobility and that we were able to see people of all ages and colors using these new services as well. The number one lesson that I wanted to share about um, working on the ground and doing these surveys is that it takes a lot of time. So it's important to bring in volunteers or contractors so that you can get the critical amount of surveys needed. Um, and we have a lot more detail in the report, so please refer to that and email us with any questions. I'm gonna pass it back to Ben now to discuss the methods findings and lessons learned of the camera observation. Thanks, Heather. Um, so as we did with curb access, um, we installed a camera on the site of the Community Mobility Hub as well. Um, this really provided an opportunity to look at travel behavior, people movement, and just use of the space before and after um, Think the uh, placemaking improvements that we made. Um, we also noticed a couple kind of anecdotal, we, we had a couple anecdotal stories that we wanted to share, I mean, particularly around the use of public transit prior to, um, prior to the inclusion of the placemaking improvements, um, saw a great deal of people waiting out in the sun after, the, after those improvements were made. We saw users of the buses uh, uh, really just using the space to shelter themselves from the sun. We also sort of on a more quantifiable level, we're able to track foot traffic um, in the area, cycle trips and dwell time. And just a couple um, data points to share here, our walk tri trips increased by 25% after the inclusion of placemaking. And most interestingly, I think, was uh, the dwell time for people on the site that, pre that typically would be going there to, to eat a food truck increased by 144%. So, Instead of uh, somebody driving up or walking up and, uh, and leaving immediately, we saw a great deal um, more dwell time at that site. Um, on the next slide, we just wanted to kind of show an illustration of how we were, um, how we were illustrating that data. This is basically just cycle trips, um, eastbound um, as well as southbound cycle trips. Um, due to the sort of limitations of the scope of our camera, we were only able to capture those routes. Um, but um, this this is we hope is kind of serving as a template for other people to do kind of low cost uh, camera based observations um, when they're conducting placemaking or tactical urbanism uh, initiatives or or simply uh, just trying to improve the space. Uh, finally, on the next slide, we have um, we have a part of a, one of the most critical pieces of our program at the outset of creating it. Uh, we thought would was uh, to really set up some data sharing agreements with the mobility partners. We wanted to get a sense of when and what, what the usage looked like before and after, um, before and after a number of the, our, our initiatives on the, on the space, uh, before and after placemaking, essentially. Um, the uh, mobility partners were super critical in ensuring that the services were available at the site. And uh, we were able to get uh, some data from a handful of them Although we weren't ultimately able to collect um, or publish uh, the sort of the most granular level of data that we were initially interested in, we were thinking about origin and destination, heat maps of usage in the area, and I think many people on the line and many people who work in cities um, and in new mobility are quite familiar with some of the challenges associated with that, particularly with some of the newer services uh, like bikes and scooters, the highly competitive. Um, industry and their uh, significant concerns around privacy as well. So, um, but uh, ultimately, uh, we think it was a, it was a success in um, understanding the impact and really the relationship between uh, the new mobility services and and the urban design improvements we made. So, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Greg, who will talk about our Mod Cities work. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so you can think of the Mod Cities concept that we developed in collaboration with other stakeholders in urban design and mobility. It's just initial thinking around how to create a place or a combination of places where there's a collaboration and experimentation approach to urban design mobility in tandem. Uh, they'd also be places for people where we could get real world responses to the types of things that would be introduced there, very much in the spirit of the pilots that 
Heather and Ben discussed. Um, and we just released a report covering how these places might come together and what their key elements could be, including means of enabling design flexibility in the urban form through both policy and available building technologies and approaches to creating short-term changes in the public space. So to bring it into a little bit more tangible a lens, on the next slide, you'll see on the left side, a traditional city where traffic peaks during the morning and evening commute, parking spaces are filling in during the morning and emptying out in the evening. Parking utilization is quite low, even where it peaks. And uh, the space devoted to parking accounts for one third of the urban land use. Uh, the lanes in the downtown corridor that kind of run through the middle are typically quite wide up to twice the width of a typical passenger vehicle and accommodate a mix of freight and transit in addition to those personal vehicles. And then on the right, you see kind of a mod city potential way of reallocating some of that underutilized space. Uh, the underutilized parking space has been converted to bike and scooter lanes. You have pedestrian and social gathering space. There are corrals or concentration points for dockless bikes and scooters. And then lane space that's been made available from reduced traffic due to people using more transit and uh, alternative mobility services, in addition to autonomous vehicles needing less width, um, which is one of the touted you know, benefits of autonomous vehicles, you have that space to allocate now to pedestrians, bicyclists, and social gathering space. And the flexibility within the public design realm is what could potentially unlock that. Um, on the next slide, you have kind of an overnight or weekend and holiday um, configuration for Mod City. Again, just a, a way of thinking about how this space could potentially be reallocated. So on the left side, um, in the traditional city, few cars are parked or in the streets, and you have freight vehicles occasionally conducting overnight deliveries. On the right side, um, you have modular stackable housing structures that have been introduced in some of that underutilized parking space, and even in the unused lanes on that downtown thoroughfare. Uh, the, the buildings are potentially flexible use. They've switched from office space to housing. You have mobile carts serving food and responding to demand um, on a kind of hourly basis. And then a narrow lane still accommodates a mix of bikes, scooters, and pedestrians. Finally, um, a street has been cordoned off on the bottom there to serve as a short-term charging station for shared electric vehicles, uh, eventually autonomous electric vehicles, and then scooters and bikes. So. We're envisioning the next steps here uh, being basically an invitation. You know, as you can tell, this is this is initial thinking. This is very early thinking about how flexibility could be uh, applied to the public realm to unlock some of the possibilities around underutilized space and take advantage of some of the things that uh, these new mobility technologies offer in terms of what types of public uh, space and city design um, possibilities are out there. So what we love to do is basically get some additional input on this idea. We've already reached out to several stakeholders and some of these ideas have already been co-developed with them, but including you know, participants on this webinar. If this is something that uh, sparks your interest and you think there's some promise here, there's a ton of unanswered questions about it. Um, so as RMI often does, we're reaching out to experts in the space that have more expertise than we do in, in urban design. Um, and we'd love to think through some of those unanswered questions together. Uh, including what the governance model might look like, what's a viable location, and what makes uh, uh, what are the criteria for identifying those locations, and then what's the operating model? What are some of the business models for how, for example, parking owners could recover some of their lost revenue from not having people park, and how would that work exactly? Um, so we invite those interested to contact us to continue the conversation uh, or to indicate your interest in participating in a workshop as early as next year and if there's sufficient interest you know um, we'd love to explore the possibility of, of hosting that workshop so with that i'll hand it back to ej uh, to let us know which questions have kind of bubbled to the surface here based on the uh, questions that participants have been chatting in great thank you so much greg uh, excellent presentation team uh, I'll also say uh, to the audience that um, Michael Painter from RWJF is on the line as well. So if anyone has a question um, geared towards him, please fire that in as well. Um, so while we, to get started here, um, the, um, the hub itself was launched um, kind of serendipitously in the midst of this uh, dockless explosion in Austin and, and really around the world, both scooters and bikes. 
you know, were coming into the city uh, during the summer and the fall. <clears throat> and I'm curious if the team could comment a little bit on um, what are your early observations around Dockless and, and where do you think it's going to go? Uh, so it was interesting for us because um, the uh, yeah, we launched right around the time that the scooter companies launched and the, and the Dockless bikes as well. Um, and those those services were largely available in the center of the city um, at first, uh, really just in, in kind of serve, serving the uh, like the tech industry there at the center of the city and just really kind of highly concentrated there. And um, we were interested in seeing how uh, what, what kind of role it could play as a service for people outside of the downtown core, people who may not have as much access to serve to other mobility services like high capacity or high frequency transit, for instance. Um, I think what we've seen on the ground is really promising for that industry as a whole and in cities around the globe in providing, um, you know, really valuable service that um, for people of all walks of life. Um, it's, uh, it's been interesting to see the success of it um, after, and it's not certainly directly due to our work, but since launching, though, those services have been expanded beyond the downtown core. I think initially when they when they started, it was it was very they were actually regulated to to only serve the downtown core. And now they're far beyond there. I think a really interesting question around these dockless services, particularly the electric ones, is charging. Right. And, and um, it's one of the most kind of cited challenges in terms of how cities are accommodating these services. A lot of the service providers have really innovative incentive models where the people who use the services are incentivized to, you know, also collect scooters and charge them at home. They can be charged in a normal outlet, unlike, you know, your typical electric or more quickly on a, a typical outlet um, than a typical electric vehicle could be. And so this question of kind of do we need charge infrastructure for dockless services or will it work to just have people take them and charge them in their garages? How do cities kind of regulate that? Some service providers don't allow the scooters to be used overnight, so that kind of opens up the charging opportunity. Others run throughout the night. So there's all these kind of questions around how that's going to work. And one of the interesting outcomes from our uh, from our uh, mobility hub is that one of our providers is actually planning to put in a charging station at the mobility hub. So it'll be an opportunity to see whether that works and and you know what types of operational challenges. Uh, are associated with concentrating those bikes at a charge station, and again, what role does the, does the home charging play in that? So I, I think that's a big question, kind of facing the dockless services moving forward. Mm -hmm. So to pivot a little bit, um, this is a question from the audience, kind of getting at that connection between placemaking and mobility. Um, <clears throat> so the question is that it seems cha that the challenging thing about the placemaking is that it's difficult to tell how much of the travel on the plaza is induced by the, those placemaking activities. Can you comment on that? Uh, do you have any sense for, you know, how the placemaking influences the, the travel or mobility there? Uh, well, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, we can't take full credit for the increase in walk trips uh, just based on the inclusion of those plants and shading. But um, there, I, I do, I, I think that, um, we can argue that the dwell time increasing is directly uh, attributed to um, those placemaking changes. A lot of the tra foot traffic on that in the area was driven by the restaurants and bars on the street. It was an interesting kind of observation, just tracking foot or measuring foot traffic throughout the day. And we started from 8 a.m. to and went to 12 a.m. Um, every day for a number of weeks um, and just observing that foot, tra foot traffic there. Um, we sort of hypothesized that, you know, this could be the beginning of a larger sort of scaling out of uh, urban design improvements that we think is reasonable to assume would have some positive impact in drawing people out of their homes and increasing walk trips. And then uh, also increasing the use of these alternative mobility services, as well as the public transit there uh, at the site. Yeah, and th this is probably a good time to highlight, you know, one of the lessons learned that Ben found, and that was some of the challenges associated with, associated with collecting data from the providers. So a big part of where we may have been able to see, let's say an uptick in use as a result of the placemaking features was kind of dependent on granular data around 
how many trips are being taken from that location and whether we can draw a correlation to those, right? Um, so I would just highlight to any cities kind of doing anything like this in the future and hoping to make that link to what kinds of improvements result in increased use uh, that you have access to that data and that you work through data agreements with the providers to ensure that you can see that. You know, we, we had a high level view of an increase in use, but it was kind of confounded with the fact that there was a huge increase in use of Docklet services anyway. So it's a little hard for us to go in there and say that a slice of that increase was due to the improvements that we made. And then we also didn't have quite the granularity of data at the geographic location where we were operating to be able to confidently say, you know, this is a direct result of what we did. But like Ben said, we did, we were able to do that with respect to the walk trips. Thanks guys. Um, you know, early in the presentation, uh, you were discussing the, the uh, international travel that you all did, um, looking at uh, some really exemplary uh, cities or interventions that have been done around the world. You know, I think a common refrain uh, that you hear is that, you know, the U.S. isn't Europe or the U.S. isn't like anywhere else, right? Um, you know, based on your travels, can you comment a little bit on the, the aspects that you saw that you think, you know, really are applicable in the U.S. context and maybe um, also those things that you think just really wouldn't fly here? Yeah, you know, one of the things that stood out about Copenhagen, it was like, it's a, it's a city of six million people. And you could say this to some extent about Barcelona as well. That it's a pretty um it's a pretty large city, but um buildings are rarely higher than you know four or five stories. And there's an ex a pretty intense mixture mix of uses in uh many of the cities that we saw. I mean a, a pharmacy, a grocery store, um, a restaurant is never more than a, a couple blocks away. Um and that's gonna have positive effects I think on um the use of alternative mobility services, I mean, basically just foregoing personal vehicle ownership. And it just makes me think of some recent things and related to sort of regulation in cities um, and cities trying to be more flexible um, with zoning or just, uh, you know, temporary development, whatever it may be. Um, of recent, uh, Minneapolis has made some pretty big news recently and in uh, enabling more density, I think, at, um, in their zoning code, like eliminating single-use zoning. Um, there, to your point, you know, people tend to say we can't do that in the U.S., but I think that we're seeing uh, recent cases that suggest otherwise. That's one thing. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think you're seeing, a, particularly with the more widespread adoption of form-based codes um, in the U.S., more flexibility around uses and including temporary uses. We saw a really interesting uh, and innovative approach to enabling short-term uses through pink zones, which were kind of um, uh, pioneered in Detroit, um, I think with the, the Knight Foundation. And that's a way of kind of saying, okay, within this zone, we're going to create um, permissiveness for particular types of temporary uses and experimental approaches uh, and see if it works, right? And so do we, 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 in some cases, have the basics from Copenhagen and Barcelona about what works with the urban form, and we can just do that but in cases where, particularly in the U.S., where we're hesitant because we're not sure whether it's going to work here, we can take these sort of interim approaches and say, well, let's try it out. Let's see how Americans respond to this type of urban form. Let's, let's take some lessons from Europe and introduce them, and in the spirit of kind of the pilot, see how they respond, and then adjust in real time. Because so much of the argument, I think, in the U.S. is that, you know, Americans are different. They won't, they won't like it as much. They're used to their cars more. But you, you know, this is this is about human development. It's not about U.S. versus Europe development. And, and there are some, uni those are universal elements of what makes a great walkable urban environment. And everybody responds positively to that once they're introduced to it. So here's a question that I know I heard through the course of this project in all different settings and in all different ways. But it all comes down to this the same point that uh, the neighborhood where this hub is, is rapidly gentrifying. You know, there's an older population that's been there for a long time and has deep ties to that neighborhood. Um, do you think that, that these efforts, um, mobility hubs specifically, and we can also talk about mobility services broadly, are serving 
um, both populations in East Austin? Thanks for the question, EJ. Um, I'm going to chime in on this because I was on the ground for the majority of the entire project. Um, you know, it was something that I experienced very different opinions on um, when I engaged with people of different ages, different colors, who were new to the community, had been living there their entire lives. And I feel like it was really split. There was, you know, some people who just said they didn't want any changes. Um, and then there were some who said, you know, like, yeah, this is my area, but I, you know, and I own a business on, you know, the street and I would love to see more people coming through so that I could also receive more business. Um, and one thing that was also interesting is that we ran into this assumption early on from so many people that um, this community and people of color and elderly citizens would not want to use mobility services, broadly speaking. And even though, yes, like the majority of users of mobility services are kind of in this young-ish range, which is hard to define what that means, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, but we, I still saw quite a number of people using these services from, um, you know, up into much older ages and then also um, of different ethnicities and, um, you know, people asking me for those services there and feeling like it was unjust that they did not have the mobility services on their side of town. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's split, but I think that these services were appreciated by um, a decent amount of the population. One, yeah, just one, one thing I would highlight there is the service providers have been very conscious of this gap and in some cases have introduced programs that allow for particular geographically fenced locations or people who meet certain criteria to get discounts um, on, you know, the service. So moving forward, again, if there's the ability to kind of direct these subsidies where they're most needed, the service providers certainly have the technical capability to be able to say, okay, this user qualifies, let's provide some of the incentive there. So we've seen some early signs of that from the providers, but I would say it's very promising moving forward in terms of what more could be done there to, to get really smart about how to um, provide the support where it's most needed rather than the way it's done today, which is typically a blanket type of subsidy that everyone ends up benefiting from. Great, thank you so much. Well, we've uh, reached the top of the hour, so we're going to have to wrap it up here. But um, I want to thank the team for their presentation today. Um, this is very exciting as we continue to uh, dive into this intersection between mobility and urban design. And again, to everyone on the line, um, if there's interest in learning more or interest in uh, developing uh, new work going forward, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.